Welcome to Loyola Marymount University. I'm Fernando Guerra. I'm professor of political science and also professor of Chicano studies. I'm also director of the Thomas and Dorothy Levy Center for the Study of Los Angeles. Tonight, you're going to witness the Urban Lecture Series. This is a lecture series that's been going on here at the university for over 10 years. We bring all kinds of community, uh, business, and nonprofit individuals to come and talk to us about issues facing our city. We hope you enjoy the show today and stay tuned for a great conversation about our great city. So, uh, this we're going to discuss quickly the Latino Political Incorporation. Uh, this data can also be found on the website for the center and on the class website for those of you who are registered in the class. Uh, what we're trying to do here is document the change that has occurred over the last 50 years. And we're trying to explain that change. How did the change occur? And then the most important question really is um, explain the difference that change makes, the so what question. And we're, one of the questions we're going to ask the panelists to explain is what difference does it make having Latinas on school board? Is there a Latina agenda? How is the Latina agenda different than a Latino agenda or a women's la uh, agenda or just a, a, a general uh, political agenda? So these are the three things we wanted to do. Document, explain the change, and then the uh, so what question. So what, what we found was that to take a look at all of the state of California or the whole country was not that manageable. So what we did, did is just take a look at Los Angeles County and Los Angeles County only. But even here we found that there are over 2,000 elective offices in Los Angeles County. In addition to the state legislature, the congressional delegation, uh, there are city council, school boards, community college boards, water districts. But you know you can also get elected to a judgeship. You can also get elected to a political party position, and these are 2,000 positions. And of course, being a member of the Central Committee of the Green Party, while important in terms of inclusion and all that, is not the same as being the uh, school board member at Lenox or the uh, uh, a council member in the city of Baldwin Park. They're just very different uh, issues. So what we did is we uh, segregated these 2,000 positions, and we used three important variables. One is constituent size. How many people do you represent in, in the district that you are elected to? Um, number two, the budget size. How many resources do you control? What is the size uh, of the budget? Number three, prestige of the position. And by prestige of the position, we meant how prestigious is it to hold, and, and we judge that by the career paths of elected officials themselves. And we let them determine the pres prestige simply by which positions do they give up to run for others. And then also the opinion of leaders. We did a survey of about 200 uh, 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 elected officials in Los Angeles County, uh, Latino, non-Latino, women, men, and asked them which were the most significant positions. And doing this, we then further segregated the 2,000 positions in LA County to the top 100, okay? So we're basically, we're going to look at the top 100 positions in Los Angeles County. And these top 100 positions are listed in what we call the, this pyramid here. And at the very top, the most prestigious position in LA County is mayor of Los Angeles, even though he only controls one third of the county. That is, the city is about um, 4 million people, and the county has 10 million. And right underneath that is the um, LA County Board of Supervisors, and below that, is the um, congressional uh, delegation, or excuse me, the district attorney and the county executives. Then below that is the House of Representatives. What I want to point out to you is that only in Los Angeles, New York, and Chicago is a member of the House of Representatives a lower position than other locally elected positions. Nowhere else in the country but New York, Chicago, and Los Angeles would a member of Congress give up his position to become mayor. So for instance, in places like uh, St. Louis or Cincinnati or places like that, people give up being mayors to run for Congress. So in, uh, here in Los Angeles, we've had uh, Congress members run for uh, mayor and even ask uh, or, or think seriously about running for mayor. So in, uh, I think in 2001, we had Congressman Javier Becerra run for mayor. Uh, uh, Congress, uh, uh, um, Congressman Polson ran for mayor and became mayor of uh, Los Angeles in 1953, et cetera. In, of course, New York, we had uh, Congressman uh, Ed Koch become mayor. In uh, Chicago, Congressman Harold Washington become mayor. And so that's a typical pattern in those three cities. But in no other city do you see that happen. And it shows you the prestige of the local positions. And one other key thing about this here is that 
in these 50 years, we have 471 people who held all these positions. In not a single case in the 50 years did any one of these 471 give up a position in the higher rank for a lower rank. Not one single case. So we have 50 years, 471 cases. Now people will say, no, I know of a, a, of a, state, a state senator who then became a state assembly member. Well, that only happens after they've been defeated for election or they were termed out. So they were outside of the pyramid. So when people get kicked out of the pyramid because they lose an election, they get termed out or something like that, they may come back into this pyramid at a lower level. But they never give up a position here to run for anything below. It's intuitive. You all know that in terms of political power and prestige. You always want a more prestigious position. And you heard Helen Torres talk about trying to get uh, um, increasingly up this uh, uh, political pyramid. And so this is quantitative da data. Uh, you hardly ever get a social science phenomenon where you can say 100% of the time in 50 years, this has never happened, OK? And it just it, it hasn't happened, OK? Um, so how did Latinas do in these 100 positions? So in 1960, there were no Latinas. That doesn't mean there were no Latinas in Los Angeles County. There were no Latinas holding one of these uh, significant positions. A Latina doesn't get elected into the significant position until the 1980s. Uh, that's not only Latinas, but also very few Latinos. In 1960, out of the top 100, this goes to 14, but it actually goes all the way to 100, okay? Out of the top 100 elective offices in Los Angeles County, there was only one Latino, and that was then uh, Council Member Ed Royalball, who became a congressman. There was only one African American, and that was a, a, a state assembly member, Augustus Hawkins, who then be, also became a congressman. And there was uh, one Jewish individual, and that was, um, I'm going to forget her name right now, she's actually still alive. Uh, she was elected in uh, 1953, was significant in bringing the, 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 uh, the Dodgers, and um, excuse me here, let's see if I can. Roslyn Wyman, thank you very much. Rosalind Wyman was elected to the city council in 1953. She was 23 years old, the first woman ever elected to the city council and the only Jew on the city council. So she shows up to the city council, the youngest ever elected, the first female, and the first Jew in over 75 years. And she was there with uh, 14 white Anglo-Saxon Protestant and some Catholic males. So you could see that the very, so the system What's the point here? In 1960, the political system of Los Angeles was closed to Latinos, blacks, Asians, women, and, and, and even Jews. So out of, the, out of the 100 position, only three were held by non-white uh, um, uh, men. And, and it's not until, again, 1980 that we get a, um, a Latina elected. And then what we have here is females in the top 100 positions. And we track um, the number of uh, uh, white females and um, Jewish, Latinas, African Americans. And again, it's a very busy graph, but it, each one is individually uh, tracked. And again, this is on our website for those of you who want specific um, uh, uh, data, okay? Then here, in the, this one, we just put uh, Latinas, African Americans, and Asian females together and uh, white and uh, Jewish females together. And an amazing thing you can see now is that there are more women of color in these positions than there are uh, white women. So there's been an incredible incorporation of women of color in the Los Angeles political system. Okay. Then here we have uh, Latinas compared to Latinos. And, and what you see here is in 1961, then it goes up a little bit, and then you see the, this is all Latinos, uh, both Latinos and Latinas combined. And here you see uh, Latinos, we separate them out right here because there's the first election of the first Latina. But what's interesting here is you, you see the continuing rate of increase and the continuing rate of increase in Latinos. The gap remains almost the same, but from then on, Latinos and Latinas continue to win at the same uh, uh, rate. A uh, very interesting uh, phenomenon that, that we see here. And then here we have our table of firsts. Um, the first uh, Latina uh, to win in the assembly was Gloria Molina, elected in 1982. 
The first Latina in the LA Community College was Leticia Quesada, elected in 85. The first Latina city councilwoman was Gloria Molina, elected in 87. The first Latina in the LA Unified School District was Leticia Quesada, also elected in 87. And the first Latina on the LA Community College Board is Gloria Molina. And the first US uh, Latina in, from Congress from Los Angeles was Lucille Royball Allard. And then the first state senator was Hilda Solis, who is now Secretary of Labor under uh, President Obama. She is in uh, President Obama's cabinet. Uh, but you can see how significant, number one, Hilda Solis, who is now a cabinet member, but Gloria Molina was the first three times. She was truly a trailblazer in the incorporation of Latinas into the um, political system of Los Angeles. Second, uh, to tell you about some future possible incorporations, and you heard Helen uh, make reference to this, there's been no Latina elected to the, an executive position uh, in Los Angeles City or Los Angeles County, meaning um, uh, mayor, uh, city attorney, city controller, district attorney, county assessor, or sheriff. As a matter of fact, there's only been one woman elected to any of those positions, and that's Wendy Gruel currently, who is the controller for the city of Los Angeles. Excuse me, I'm going. Okay. And second is that there's been no Latina elected to any statewide constitutional office or any um, uh, U.S. Senate position. Um, so and we've had several women. As a matter of fact, the two U.S. Senators for California right now are, of course, women. And there have been several women who have been elected to uh, different positions, including Kamala Harris, who's currently the Attorney General, or Deborah Bowen, who's currently uh, Secretary of State. So it's not unusual to have women in California elected statewide. We've just never had a Latina. And of course, there's never been a Latina who served on the California Supreme Court. Uh, Governor Brown currently has the opportunity to do that, given that there is a vacancy, and it was Judge Moreno who resigned, and the likelihood is that a Latino will be appointed, uh, and possibly a Latina, okay? And here, instead of uh, looking at, uh, this is statewide in, um, excuse me, this is countywide. So this is only in Los Angeles County. We talked about the top two, 100 positions. This is including all the um, uh, uh, offices as a, um, city council and, and, and school board uh, and uh, water districts. And so we were talking about there's 2,000 elected positions. Uh, this, th this graph only counts really about 1,000 a, a th a of them. So about 30% now of the elected positions at the citywide level are uh, Latinos. Of those, 199 are uh, males and 105 females, and you get the percentages there, okay? And to have this discussion with us about what all this means is our guest, and we're going to call our guest up here. If we can come up here, and I'll go down here and start introducing them. If you would, welcome to Loyola Marymount University and the Urban Lecture Series, sponsored by the Center for the Study of Los Angeles, the Political Science Department, the Economics Department, Urban Studies, Chicano Studies, and a variety of different other units of uh, Loyola Marymount University. Today, we're going to be discussing the political inclusion of previously excluded groups, specifically looking at Latinas. And we're taking a look at the political system of Los Angeles and how uh, Latinas have become incorporated in the last couple of years and what was occurring in terms of that process. Um, to help us um, analyze and assess much of the data that has already been presented and discussed, we have a uh, panel of distinguished uh, elected officials and organizers that have been active uh, in uh, California and Los Angeles politics for many years. I'm going to start on my uh, far left and introduce um, Marisol Cruz. She is a board member from the Lenox School Board. Uh, Lenox is a, a small, unincorporated community uh, just um, east of LAX uh, between uh, Century Boulevard and Imperial Boulevard. Mm -hmm. Uh, and it's uh, surrounded by LAX and, and Inglewood and Hawthorne, and it's unincorporated. It's not a city, and therefore it does not have city government. It's run by the county, except its school board uh, at the elementary level is independently elected, and she is a member of that. Um, Marisol is an immigrant to Los Angeles, not by choice. I think you were three months old when your uh, parents brought you over and uh, you moved into uh, 
into Lenox. She's lived there her whole life, went to those schools, uh, then went on to uh, Cal State Long Beach, is currently doing some uh, uh, graduate work in Chicano Latino studies and public policy as well, and is currently an a activist and more importantly a school board member in um, Lenox, where I think her two children also attend uh, that, that school. So it's very, very personal. So Marisol Cruz. Gracias. Uh, next to uh, Marisol is Council Member Susan Rubio. She is a council member from the city of Baldwin Park. Uh, she was first elected as city clerk, to the, which is a citywide uh, office, as is uh, council in, in the city of Baldwin Park for a four-year term in November of 2005. Um, of course, she wanted to make a, continue to make an impact in her community, so she ran for uh, council to have a greater policy say. Uh, she graduated from Belmont High School, uh, close to downtown Los Angeles, and she earned her Bachelor of Arts degree and her Master's degree in education from Azusa Pacific University. Uh, she began her career in education by working for the Monrovia Unified School District and worked there for three years as assistant principal and program advisor uh, for one of the elementary schools. She currently teaches third grade, so she can relate to a lot of us here. Uh, Susan <laughs> Rubio. Thank you. Um, next to her is um, Angela Acosta Salazar. She is a trustee or a board member of the Community College Board or the Rio Hondo Board of Trustees. Um, she gra is a graduate of UC Irvine and has completed her MA in Community and Regional Planning from the University of New Mexico in Albuquerque. She was re-elected to the Board of Trustees in November 2009 for her second term. She was first elected, obviously, in November of 2005. She was elected Vice President of the Board of Trustees at the uh, meeting held in, in December 2008, and she represents trustee area number three, which includes the cities of Whittier and South El Monte. Uh, she, uh, um, she has previously uh, represented the University of California Office of the President as the uh, employed by the Puente Project within that organization. Uh, from 2001 to 2006, she was direct, uh, director of the Hope Leadership Institute, a nine-month program designed to train Latina women that you heard all about from Ms. Helen Torres, so I don't have to say anything more about that. Um, she has experience in voter registration, campaigns, community economic development, research, uh, event coordination, and I can go on and on about uh, these uh, young women. Um, so, Ms. Acosta. I just had to keep turning the pages about her, so. Uh. <laughs> Next, we have the youngest in the group, uh, Dolores Huerta. She is currently uh, president of the Dolores Huerta Foundation. She was born in, can I say, in 1930, which then they all know you're, Thanks. okay, 19, you're not uh, embarrassed like uh, Professor Hoffman about 35 years? We had a big uh, 80th birthday party at the Greek last year. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's right, who performed at that? Carlos Santana, yeah. and Zach yeah, de la Rocha, Pete Escobedo, Culture Clash, and on and on. <laughs> and that's some party, huh? Yeah. She was born in a mining town in uh, Dawson in the northern mountains of New Mexico. Her father was a farm worker and a miner, a union activist who ran for political office and ended up uh, winning an election to the uh, New Mexican state legislature in 1938. But I think she gets most of her feminist uh, uh, seeds uh, that were planted by her mother, who was very independent and entrepreneurial and ended up running uh, or owning and running a, uh, a hotel room where I'm told stories that she you would let people stay for free and things of that nature. So maybe she wasn't that entrepreneurial. That's she was very good. Um, I, you know, uh, she is an icon in the uh, Chicano Latino community. I can go on and on. I have like 20 pages of, uh, of their books written about her. It's uh, someone that we can talk, and we're going to uh, just give you a little bit of a flavor. She continues to work tirelessly developing leaders, advocating for the working poor, women, and children. She's currently president of her foundation. She travels daily speaking to students at universities in organizational forums like this one, trying to impact others on social justice and policy issues. Um, she has received numerous awards, among them the Eleanor Roosevelt Human Rights Award from President Clinton in 1998. 
Ms. Magazines, one of the three most important women of 1997. Ladies Home Journal's 100 Most Important Women in the 20th Century. The Puffin Foundation Award for Creative Citizenship Labor Leader Award in 1984. Kern County's Women of the Year by the California State Legislature. The Otley Award from the Mexican government, which is given to the uh, Mexican abroad that's most significant in terms of the prestige of uh, the Mexican government. The, Smith, the James Smithen Award from the Smithsonian Institution. She's been given over nine honorary doctorates from, the, from universities in the United States. So we have to refer to her as uh, Dr. Huerta from now on here in this, <laughs> in this academic uh, setting. Um, of course, what she's best known for uh, is the co-founder of the United Farm Workers with Cesar Chavez, who she uh, got along with famously and didn't get along with famously. And we're going to ask her a little bit about that. But one of the things that captured my attention and I really wanted her to be here for is little known that she um, was uh, part of a, a, a group called the Feminist Majority, the Feminization of Power 5050 by the year 2000. And the idea there was to have um, Latinas and other women in general, but Latinas in particular, run for office to create the time when they would be 50% of all elected uh, women would uh, be, uh, um, um, excuse me, 50% of all elected officials would be uh, women. Um, again, I can go on and on about Dolores Huerta. She's got tremendous amount of stories, uh, tremendous amount of, I mean, from day one, she's been involved in politics, labor, et cetera. So I'm gonna ask her the first question. And it's really more in general about your, your life story and what difference that you see today. We've talked about uh, the incorporation of Latinas and Latinos in politics. We've all strived to make sure that that happens. Um, number one, what's the big difference that you see today in 2011 compared to 10 years ago, 20 years ago? And is it what you expected to have seen at this time in terms of incorporation that had occurred? Uh, well, before I, before I say anything, I do want to thank uh, the students of L LMU, and especially those of you that have come to uh, help us out on spring break, okay? Because you have made such a big difference in the farm workers' lives, and every year we have LMU students come uh, down there to work with farm workers. The people I work with are not the professional women. They are the immigrant women, they're the poor women, and uh, they do incredible stuff. And one thing that I do want to talk about, because when we talk about getting people elected to office, especially women, I want to make a distinction, uh, and, and this is an important distinction because when we think of uh, women in power, and we do, yes, we do need to get women uh, to be, uh, I like to say, decision makers. Uh, when we need to have gender balance, we need not only women but people of color uh, to be on those decision making boards. And although women are 52% of the population, we are number 70 in the world in the United States of America in terms of women in government number 70 in the world. In our U.S. Congress, we're only 16%. Women are only 16% uh, in the Congress. And uh, I like to tell this story about when they did a survey of male students in one of our Ivy League colleges, and they asked the male students how many of them thought they were qualified to run for office. 85% of the male students said, yes, we're qualified. But when they asked the women the same question, only 30% of the women thought that they were qualified to run for office. So that really means that right from the very beginning, women, because of low self-esteem, or they just don't think you know, that, they, that they can run for office. Maybe uh, they're they just not as arrogant. <laughs> that too. But, <laughs> but they don't even try. And in fact, in 1992, when we did the Feminization of Power campaign, when, and by the way, 1992, this is after the last census, the feminist majority, we went through the state of California. There were three of us, and we got women together uh, you know, some of them were uh, women's studies or uh, whatever group happened to be now, uh, you know, National Women's Political Caucus, whatever. We got them together. I don't think Hope, I don't remember meeting with Hope people, but we got them together and said, look, there's going to be an open seat here. Uh, you've got to get together. You've got to find somebody to run. And if you can't find somebody to run, one of you has to run. And you know what? We got 100 women running for office, some ran for city council, board of supervisor, Congress. In fact, that year, is the year that Lucille Roybal got elected to the Congress, the first Latina here in California. Lydia Velasquez, the first Puerto Rican woman uh, in New York, right? We had the largest number of African-American and Latina women ever elected to the state legislature. 
the largest number ever. That's when Hilda Solis, Grace Napolitano, on and on, all got elected and the largest number of African-American women. By the way, that number has now shrunk. But I want to make a cautionary note here. And we talked about a representative from uh, Southern Kern County, from Bakersfield, California, uh, who Helen and I worked very hard to get her elected. Uh, very lovely woman. But once she got elected, you know what? She didn't do what we expected. She voted against the farm workers every chance she could. She was picketed. Didn't, she didn't bother. This last election, uh, she endorsed Meg Whitman, who's running for <laughs> the Republican woman running for. Even uh, though she's a Democrat. And she's not anymore, I don't believe, but she was for a while. So the, the cautionary note that I want to make is this. See, I think we have to use the word, instead of using the word women, use the word feminist, OK? Use the F word, feminist, OK? <laughs> and the reason I say this is because uh, it, it's not enough just to be a woman. You've got to use, we've got to be feminists. We've got to be people that are going to stand up for the rights of immigrants, the rights of union workers to become unionized, right? The rights of the environment, you know, the rights of LGBT people in our society, you know, people that stand up for peace. So let's use the word feminist. And by the way, men can also be feminists, okay? It's not a term that needs to be uh, to women. And so, and, and what we have ha happening now, and this is, this is a new game right now because women are winning uh, elections. So we have the right wing, and I know some of you know this name, Halen, sound familiar? So we see the conservatives in the right ring that are running women. We just had this happen in New Mexico, and you probably heard, yeah, we got this Latina, Sarah Martinez, first governor, uh, Latina governor of any state, I believe, in the United States of America, but she's a right winger. The first thing she did, she got rid of driver's licenses for undocumented, right? She wants to put everybody in jail. I mean, uh, and the woman she ran against, uh, who was not Latina, uh, was actually Diane Dennett, a very good progressive woman. And this is a new strategy that the right wing is using down in there in uh, El Paso, Texas. We had a very strong Latina, Norma Chavez. She's the one that got the Cesar Chavez holiday through to the state legislature, fought for unemployment insurance for farm workers, for toilets in the fields for farm workers. And guess what? They got this young, pretty attorney, Latina, and she took her out. It was, came out of the blue. She didn't expect it. She had won her previous election by over 78%. So this is a new strategy. So when we think of who we are supporting, for political office, we have to see what are their politics, right? What are their politics? And even sometimes when they run for office, they lie, as we know, like in Wisconsin, you know? So we've got to not only see uh, where they're at before they run, but stay on top of them after they run. We have to always remember that politicians work for us. We pay their taxes, I mean, we pay their wages with our taxes, and they work for us. And uh, just before I stop, I just want to say that we have two great women that I was going to mention when we talk about great women in the audience, okay? Uh, one of them is uh, Barbara Carrasco, uh, an internationally known muralist. She was uh, chosen the outstanding Latina muralist uh, in, uh, by the Bellos Artes in Mexico City. And Barbara, who was also taught here at LMU. Stand Barbara, up, Barbara. And a member of my board. Uh, then we have also Maria Reza. Maria Reza is with uh, Comisión Femenil. And she does a wonderful conference every, every year of young Latina women called Adelante Mujer, where she brings together all the high school kids, all the way from the San Fernando Valley. Maria Dessa, could we give her an applause? <laughs> her husband, Alex, who has mentored many of the people that now sit on the city council and that are so-called great politicians, uh, El Señor Alex Dessa. El Padrino de San Fernando. <laughs> the Godfather of San Fernando. Uh, Angela, before I go, do you want to introduce anybody? <laughs> no. No. <laughs> um, you know, Dolores makes a very important point. There's, and we've talked about this in, in our classes, that we have what we call descriptive representation and substantive representation. By descriptive representation, we mean that it, they, they describe a group, either a woman, uh, ethnic, uh, poor, or what have you. But substantive representation is what Dolores is talking about, that they describe the substance of the policies that, uh, that, that are important. So what difference do feminist Latina elected officials make. When you think about the type of policies that you pursued, how do you, how are you different on the board than the uh, other board members that are not feminist Latinas, either Latinos or, or, or white males? Do you approach 
do Latinas approach the job differently? Uh, give us a sense of what, how you've tried to organize uh, your role at the uh, Rio Hondo um, uh, Community College Board. Uh, first of all, I just wanted to say what an honor it is to be here with all of you LMU students, uh, Dolores Huerta. I want to thank Fernando for putting the panel together in conjunction with Hope and, and Helen Torres. I think this is a really important discussion, and I'm glad to see that there's a lot of people here. Um, in terms of the question, I think it makes a huge difference to have a Latina at the table. Um, I think one of the things that we bring to the table is our story. It is our parents' story. It is their parents' story. Um, I come from a small town, Colton. I don't know if anybody knows where Colton is. It's a boonies, a working class uh, community. And I think by the mere fact of bringing, again, like I said, the experience to the table, when issues come up, when we're talking about student success at the community college level, um, and again, understanding, working with hope, uh, Southwest Voter Registration Project, and those organizations that are empowering people, it's, it's, it's not only the stories, but it's the preparation that I believe um, that I was afforded by, by working with these important organizations to be able to approach the policy in a way that how is this really impacting the students that we serve? Um, I do represent Whittier and South El Monte, and it's two very distinct communities. Um, and I want to make sure that while I'm there, I'm bringing, again, uh, a large uh, community of women, community of family, community of working families, community um, ideas and thoughts, but making sure that we are addressing the issue at this point in my capacity of student success at the community college level, because the success of the students at our community college means the strength and success of the communities that we serve. And again, I have to make sure that uh, I know I try to keep in touch with what's happening at the federal, the state, and the local level, but ultimately I am accountable to the communities, which is South and Monte and Whittier, um, that I serve. And I have to make sure that when I'm running for office, uh, I'm asking them, what do you think? What is it? What do you need from the community college? And I have to let a lot of that dictate when I'm at the table, what policies we bring and what we're serving. And so some of the things that we're addressing now are, what do we mean by student success? Um, when I ran, it was, access to higher education, which means affordability, um, making sure that students, we're offering the classes that they need, making sure that when they do come to us, we're providing all of those wraparound services so that they can be successful and get through there in a timely manner or meet their goal, whatever their goal is, in a timely manner and with support. And so we're doing that, again, um, with policy. And I'd like to say that all of the things that I've experienced from, again, being from Colton, UC Irvine, New Mexico, Southwest Voter, Hope, um, all of that, I'm able to, that preparation has afforded me the ability to address policy. Um, I think one of the things we're seeing in politics right now is a lot of grandstanding and a lot of rhetoric. Um, and it's easy to do that. But I think what Latinas bring to the table is that preparation because I think one of the things when people ask, are you a leader or are you able to, I think oftentimes we have the skills, sometimes we just fear we don't have the preparation. Um, but we can and we do, and I think that's important by enabling us to be more substantive. Well, let me follow up on that last statement that you made with Susan Rubio, council member from Baldwin Park, and also um, Dolores Huerta mentioned that uh, in this survey that many more uh, um, males thought they were eligible for office or were gonna run. Why did you run? What made you think that you could do a better job than whoever else was going to run for uh, city council? Well, I have a, a long story, but I'm willing to share. You know, I just had the privilege to have, I have an older sister, actually, she's just a year older than I, and I was lucky enough to see her just be such a trailblazer in her field. She was actually the youngest elected to the local water board in my city, and uh, the youngest and the first female president of that board. And so I actually, earlier, I think I heard someone say, and I believe it was you, talk about how sometimes we don't think we have either the courage or sometimes it has to do with um, just confidence. And so I was one of those women in the background just helping my sister, helping organize, walking, phone banking, doing what I had to do to make sure that we had someone as amazing as my sister representing us. And so it took a little while and a lot of persuading from my sister. and. And really, it does boil down to sometimes experience rather than um, qualifications. 
Um, we were talking about, you know, the difference between males and females, and, well, first of all, I have to say, you're going to be really happy when I tell you this. We have three major governing boards in our city. We have the city council, the school board, and the water district, and as of my election in 2009, females hold the majority in each single uh, board. Um, we have, um, the, currently, the president of the Baltimore Park Unified School District is a female. Our mayor pro tem is a female, Latina, and the water board vice president is a female. Latina, so I'm really happy to report that we do make up the majority. We have 18 elected seats, and 13 of those are held by Latina females. So I want to just say congratulations to everyone that's worked so hard on getting us there, and you definitely have been instrumental. So what's going on in Baldwin Park that this is happening? What, what explains <laughs> that only in Baldwin Park Latinas are doing so well? Well, and you is know it, what? Is it the water or what? It could be. It could be. And, and I'll tell you, I was the elected city clerk prior to being in the council, so I do hold a lot of the, the old records. And it was interesting to see. I had a, a yearbook from 1980, and just what I saw, you know, Caucasian, male, over 60, were the majority in every single governing board. And uh, it's interesting to see just the shift. You know, the median age now is 40. Um, the youngest one in our board, I believe, is 34. And uh, you didn't see that before. And I think it's just the courage that we give one another to see someone go ahead and do it. We used to just sort of sit in the background. And, and again, going back to me seeing my sister just be so, you know, so amazing and really do good things for the community, then you start thinking, I can do it. I really can do it. And uh, the reality is that um, I wasn't brought up in politics. And it's interesting that every time I tell my story, people always ask, is your mother a teacher? Is she in politics? Your father? They always want a reason why. Because if you think about it, I was sort of led into this by my sister, but she did it on her own. Our parents are not politicians. In fact, they, you know, they're immigrants to this day. They don't speak English, if you can believe that. Um, I also came to this country when I was six years old. And so we did have to fight every obstacle that was put before us. And so, again, it's just believing in yourself, knowing that you can do it. And I think it's really important that we hold each other's hands and pull each other up because I think what we see a lot in politics is instead of uniting and working together to ensure that we open the door for future generations, it sees, sometimes we get caught up in the politics of it and unfortunately that's the way it is, but I think that if we really held each other's hands and, and move forward and we can make a difference, we did it in our city, like I said, my sister holding my hand, then we helped someone else who is now the president of the school board and it's just you know paying it forward, moving forward together. Um, Marisol Cruz, uh, we heard um, Susan talk about 13 of the 18 positions being Latinas. Uh, the Lenox School District currently has five members. All of them are, are Latinas. Is that correct? We're Latinas until recently the re-election. Mm -hmm. um, now there's four Latinas and one male. So, so you guys, we, for a for a uh, time there, it was all Latinas. And so, and in addition, there's obviously a very important link between Loyola Marymount University and Lenox. I think over one third or 33 percent of all teachers at Lenox are graduates of uh, LMU, and our school uh, school of education has a very important link with that uh, community in terms of providing administrators, et cetera. Um, in this transition that occurred in um, um, Lennox happened quickly that all, all of a sudden and one of the school board members by the way is also one of our former students who sat in this very classroom Angela Fajardo yes. um, so when you were all five were women did you guys vote in unison at all times and if not what were the issues that uh, sometimes where you had a 3-2 vote or a 4-1 vote um, surprisingly no um, sometimes it would be um, I was usually more on the majority three to two, um, but most of the time, you know, there was a little bit more of a conservative, conservative uh, voting aspect to it um, with the other um, two f female um, board members that were there at the time, which is Maria Verduzco Smith and Maribel Amaya. And it just so coincides that them two as well were not parents, and I think that had a bit to do with it. Um, because I believe strongly that the personal is political, the political is personal. Every decision that we were making was hitting home. So why did you run for political office? Oh, <laughs> long story, but at that time there was um, a grassroots movement. Pero means but for those of you who oh, aren't. Oh, I'm uh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, yeah, there was a, a, a grassroots movement with parents of the Lenox School District 
um, because they were taking away Spanish. And um, at that time, my eldest son, Samuel, Samuelito, um, was going to get enrolled in, in kindergarten. And I read in La Opinion, I, and I was very in denial, like, Ay, como, como va a ser? how is this possible? Um, Lenex, 98 plus percent Latinos taking away the home language, the roots, the history, the identity. Um, so I went around in my own backyard and got informed and um, parents gave me the whole 411 on what was going down and I'm like, well, you know what, if you don't, they were looking for a candidate to run with this, um, with this whole political um, dynamics going on, on the, in the, at the time, the current board in Lenox. Um, and I, and I, I was really, passionate, um, especially because my two children were going to attend and me myself um, growing up in, in, in my community. Um, I said, see, if you guys don't find anyone, you know, I'm right here, this is where I live, this is my number, and, and sure, a couple months after that, they, they called me up, interviewed me, and we had a lot of similar ideals and beliefs, and we ended up uh, winning that election. We are at Loyola Marymount University at the Urban Lecture Series discussing uh, the incorporation of previously excluded groups, specifically Latinas. We have with us um, Dolores Huerta, uh, from uh, the Dolores Huerta Foundation, uh, Angela Acosta from the Rio Hondo Community College Board, uh, Susan Rubio from the City Council of Baldwin Park, and Marisol Cruz from the um, School Board in Lenox. Um, what do you think, Dolores? What do you, when you hear these three young public officials, Latinas, talk, what, what does it uh, uh, make you think about all your work that you've been doing for, uh, mi for many years? And what would you, like to ask them. I'm going to turn it over to you and let you ask them a couple of questions. Make sure that they're feminists. <laughs> well, uh, I just want to say one thing before I ask the question is that in the, in the work that we do, our community organizing work, uh, that's part of what we do also is <clears throat> get, get people to run for office. Excuse me. <clears throat> and in fact, in our water board, uh, which we had, they had a company from Texas that was really gouging the people. Uh, so we took over the water board and we uh, got four out of the five positions and fired the company from Texas, right? And uh, the people that we elected the water elected the water board, they're immigrants. I mean, they're they, they're now uh, you know residents and citizens of the United States. They never went to school at all in the United States ever, you know. Uh, but uh, we got them elected, and uh, the same thing we got uh, another immigrant elected to the school board, you know. And uh, and her English is, is not the greatest, but she's very very strong. In fact, we had a uh, kind of a, a brawling school board meeting last night <laughs> over there in a little town called uh, uh, Wheat Patch. If any of you have read The Grapes of Wrath, <laughs> uh, let me students that have been there, you've been there. <laughs> anyway, uh, so I think that, that that's important. I, I like your story, Marisol, because I think a lot of times uh, people think that you've got to have a college degree uh, to run for office, and you don't. You know, as long as you, and you can learn on the job the way that our uh, people are learning on the job. You know, the women that are on our water board, they're kind of learning on the job. And I guess the question I want to ask of all three of you is uh, you got yourself elected and people voted for you, uh, and uh, uh, what do you do in terms of keeping your constituents engaged? Uh, because I think that's one thing that a lot of people who get elected to office forget to do that, and they want to separate themselves from the people that elected them. And uh, which is, you know, because once you get elected, people really pester you a lot, right? They want this and they want that, and they're, you know, and so I'm just wondering how, how you handle that, and if you're able to, you know, keep them engaged in the political process. Go ahead, Angela. Um, yeah, and ter uh, after when I first ran, you know, she's talking about people pestering you. She's talking about people like herself. <laughs> who, right? No, absolutely. Um, I ran for office because I wanted to make a difference in education education for the communities that we serve, education for Latinos, because I knew that community college is where the majority of us start our higher education process. Um, and in terms of, so when I ran for office, um, first of all, I had to call my mom, my husband, my, a group of people together, say, hey, are we going to do this together? Because it isn't just a, a single, you can't just, I couldn't just decide, like, oh, I think I'm gonna run for office. It had to be a family thing. And when so the, the number one thing, and I hear this from a lot of elected officials, not just uh, women, but men as well, that the number one thing when you're going to run for public office is you have to first and foremost have the buy-in of your family. Absolutely. Because if you don't, it's just not going to be successful. Well, you have to assess where you are in your life as well. I had just gotten married. 
Uh, I was a newlywed at that time, and so when. So running for uh, the campaign was your honeymoon? <laughs> no, 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 no. I, I, thank God we took our honeymoon before I was married in September. This didn't happen until August uh, when we had to make the decision. So, um, but I had to assess a lot of things, and that was one in terms of where I was in my personal life, my professional life. Uh, if we did this, we're going to do it full force, put everything we had into it, and and do a good run, and uh, also really assess, you know, in terms of you, not only uh, for me it was I ha had to have, of course, the passion, um, the interest, the support of my family, the ability to raise funds, and the motivation to go out there and walk and knock on doors for months. And when we ran the campaign, we ran it full blown, like, a, like if I was running for president or assembly or senate or what we ran a full blown campaign. And um, so we knocked on doors. I knocked on a, a, a lot of doors, just asking people about community college. And I learned a lot about number one people's uh, thoughts about the community college. Some people didn't care. They're like, oh, well, I don't have anybody in the community college. I don't care. Some people were, had a big connection, a personal connection. Some people wanted to have a connection but didn't know how. Um, and so, number one, it was, that was really important for us. And since then, what we do is, is we do try, I, of course we have to, um, one of the things we instituted on the board was having community meetings in the community. So we would rotate um, every year where each district would have, so for example, I represented Whittier in the third district, I would have my com board meeting in the community, and then we would send an invitation to that district, especially, so that they could attend the community, and then I would go and I would tell a lot of the community leaders, hey, <coughs> I'd like you to come to this community meeting, we're gonna have it at a North Whittier Elementary School, or, um, so that was one thing we do, uh, that we enacted to make sure we were keeping everyone engaged um, and another thing that we, that I like to do is, is we do updates on the college on a yearly basis. It takes a lot of time, but we go to a lot of the organizations, a lot of the, uh, uh, the different um, councils, uh, neighborhood associations, and we give an update on how, what the college is doing and, and what we're trying to do, and also get feedback. I just want to emphasize to the students and to the audience that what we have here is a representative from the Community College Board, which is um, Angela Acosta Salazar, but also a representative from a city council, uh, which is Susan Rubio, and then a representative from a, uh, a unified, or excuse me, an elementary school district, uh, Lennox, which is um, Marisol Cruz. So you have three different levels. All of these positions are part-time. They meet uh, once every two weeks, sometimes every week, depending on things that are happening. They don't get paid very much, um, so it's not about uh, it's about the money. Yet they have tremendous uh, responsibilities in terms of the budget and the services that the uh, um, cities uh, and school districts have to provide. Uh, Susan, how do you stay connected? Uh, how do you keep the pulse on the community? That what uh, Dolores was talking about, and how do you know you're talking to the right people? Because sometimes it becomes very insular. You think you're talking to the community, and you are, but only some aspect of it. And, and how do you make sure that you do have a pulse on the right people in terms of the community? Well, first of all, I want to just say, you know, I don't want anyone to walk away thinking that being an elected official is something easy. It really is not. And you have to really, really be committed to what you want to do. And uh, when I heard um, you say right now it's part time, you know, that's foreign to me because it's not part time. You're on the clock 24 7. Really, I could look back at some of my weeks where I had an event Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. And Saturday and Sunday, and if you think about it, we have full-time jobs. I teach full-time, that's my career. And so you're really never part-time. And so one of the key of staying engaged is really truly trying to make every single event possible. We, I, at least for myself, I just don't attend functions that pertain to the school district, I'm sorry, to the city, but I'm always at the school district, water district, and um, every once in a while we have uh, community charrettes where we engage the community, we have them come over and give us ideas, what do you want in your street, and we have them in different parts of the city, and, uh, and sometimes, really, um, the city is so large, we have 85,000 um, residents, but it is hard to stay connected with every single one of them, so we do 
these charrettes where we go around the community in different areas and they tell us what they want. Um, one of the things that I vowed as an elected official to do is stay connected with what I used to do before. I am very involved with the Women's Club, uh, Ballon Park Sister Cities. I served on the board for five years. And these are organizations that are constantly working with the community, giving scholarships out, um, seeing what they can do for their community. So I stay connected to these organizations because then they help me stay connected to, to other people. And that's how you um, always engage yourself, by being present and always being mindful that they're not gonna come and seek you out. Sometimes they, they will, but sometimes they won't. And so you need to go out to the community. Every event that we do have, I try to be present, whether it is a concert in the park, and we have some of those eight during the summer, I'm there every single co concert. And you walk around and you let people know that they could come and talk to you. Any questions they wanna ask you, anything they wanna talk about, and just first and foremost, let them know that you are human, you're there just like they are, and we are residents. A lot of the people think that we don't live there. That is why we represent the city, because we're there, and we have the same needs they do. So, you know, working together, I think that's key. So, earlier in the presentation, we talked about 50 years of political diversity. It was almost 50 years, actually 49 years around this time, that Dolores Huerta and Cesar Chavez started the uh, United Farm Workers. Um, and in, in kind of preparation for 50 years of the founding, uh, there's been all kinds of discussions and uh, several books that have come out on the United Farm Workers and Cesar Chavez. Certainly we have the uh, Cesar Chavez holiday, March 31st, which by the way, this university celebrates and we closed the university down, even though it's on a Thursday. And students don't particularly mind that because they can, you know, they usually start partying on Thursday nights anyway. This gets them a, a little bit earlier. Now they do Wednesday night on, on that particular day and they celebrate Cesar Chavez that way. Um, but in, in these books that have come through, some, some incredible books have come out recently on Cesar Chavez. And some of them make it out that he, he, he incredibly charismatic, but it's also incredibly difficult person at times. It, it, in, in some of the uh, are, are pretty critical. But they also talk about you and your relationship with him, that you two really went at it in terms of vision, not in, ter in terms of strategy, not in terms of vision. I'm mostly talking about st tactics, not strategy. You're right, tactics, right. T talk about that relationship you had w with uh, Cesar Chavez and how the two of you uh, discussed uh, the tactics and, and what to do. Uh, well, uh, let me go back just a little bit. Um, Oh, you talked about Eduardo Roybal, Ed Roybal being the first Latino elected to the City Council of Los Angeles and then the first Latino to the U.S. Congress. And he actually came out of an organization called the Community Service Organization, uh, which both Cesar and I belong to. And uh, this was started by a, a great individual named Fred Ross Sr., uh, who happened to uh, have worked uh, with the um, Okies and the Arkies, the people from the Dust Bowl that came to California. Uh, in that migrant labor camp in Weed Patch, California, the one that, uh, that uh, John Steinbeck writes about. Later on, he uh, went on to work with the Japanese when they were relocated into concentration camps. Uh, then he worked and organized, this is Fred Ross, worked uh, organized down in Orange County where they had the school segregated, where they had the Mexican kids in one school and the Anglo kids in another school. That resulted in the lawsuit, Mendes versus Westminster. Uh, by the way, Sylvia Mendes, uh, who was the daughter, I believe, of one of those children that was denied access to the Anglo School just won the Freedom of Medal Award from President Obama. Then Fred What was important about that, though, is that lawsuit happened before Brown versus the Board of Right, Topeka. and, Thur and Thurgood yeah. Marshall actually came and was on that lawsuit. And then uh, Fred Ross, the reason he ended up, well, he started out in Los Angeles as a teacher at USC, but then he ended up uh, in Los Angeles uh, during the Zoot Suit Riots. And those of you that took Chicano studies should know about that. And this, the Mexican kids used to wear these zoot suits. I think we saw Malcolm X, you remember the big hats and the, and the tight uh, you know, pants on the bottom. And, and uh, so Fred Ross was called in to do something about the Mexican problem. And, he's, and uh, oh, he met with the city council. I mean, the, the, actually, uh, he was hired by a group of Jewish people. Saul Alinsky from Chicago had come out. And uh, uh, when, uh, so Saul Alinsky told him, well, if you want to solve the Mexican problem, you got to help them get organized, right? Well, city council didn't want to hear that. They didn't want to get all these people out there in East LA organized because that would shake up the political process, right? Like create the graphs that we just saw behind us. And uh, so then after that, uh, the, uh, the, that group called the Community Service Organization went across the state uh, to change some of the laws. And one of the big laws that we changed was to get rid of the citizenship requirements for people to get public assistance. People couldn't get an old age assistance. They couldn't get aid to the disabled, aid to the blind, unless they were US citizens. 
and we were able to change that law way back in 1961 uh, because a lot of the immigrants, their kids had gone off to war, to World War II, and yet they couldn't even get an old age pension even though they'd lived here all, almost all their entire lives and all, all of their children were born here. Uh, so Cesar, he organized Cesar in San Jose, organized me in Stockton, California. And the thing that Cesar and I had in common is that we wanted to see farm workers get organized. I had organized a group of farm workers in Stockton. He had organized farm workers in the Oxnard area. And Cesar, uh, for people that knew Cesar, and I know there's people in the room that know him, uh, Cesar was a very quiet, humble person. When they talk about Cesar being charismatic, I think his charisma was just, he, he was just, uh, like the Dalai Lama, you know, the Dalai Lama, you think of the Dalai Lama, uh, and he's a very quiet person, uh, and that's kind of the way Cesar was. His charisma came not from him being, you know, blustery or really, uh, you know, you know he, he didn't have like a strong personality, but you felt his strength and his, and his humbleness and his quietness, I think that's the way, and, and his strength, because he was so strong and very focused, very determined. I think the differences that Cesar and I had, looking back, I think it was the difference between the way women look at things and the way men look at things, right? <laughs> and I always like to give the example of uh, when we did the boycott. I went to New York City, uh, did the great boycott, and uh, took on the smaller chain, the smaller independent stores. And I went to the smaller chain stores. And then when I got all those stores, got the grapes out of all those stores, then I hit the big chains, right? So we got all of New York City clean except one store. I came back to California, Caesar was still fighting Safeway, okay? He took the macho route, right? You go after the biggest store first, right? So anyway, I came back, I came back to California and, and did my same tactics that I did in New York City, and guess what? We got the, all the stores clean in California. And, and so I think this is a, you know, we, were, we just had a different way of looking at things, and it was mostly, uh, mostly tactical because we always believed in the same things. We had the same philosophy. Uh, we had the same goals. But sometimes the way we did things was just a little bit different. And so we would have these huge arguments on tactics. Um, sometimes I would win, and sometimes he would win, okay? But uh, we would have these big arguments, and people would kind of get scared, you know, because we both felt very strongly. Uh, but then, you know, I'd go back to my office, he'd go back to his office, and I'd pick up the phone, or he'd pick up the phone. Okay, what are we gonna work on next, you know? So we, it was all over. But sometimes, I mean, I think when you are an organization, that people don't always think alike. I'm sure and hope they don't always think alike. At least I hope they don't. You know, you've got to have arguments, you've got to have discussion, because otherwise uh, you don't really get to new ideas or, or, or different ideas if everybody just thinks the same. And I think that's one of the things, uh, some things times we have this with women. Uh, when women are in a, a you know, uh, with men in a, in, a, in a group, women are afraid to speak out because they're afraid they're gonna say the wrong thing, right? And I know many of us have been in a room when, you know, Maria says something, nobody heard it, but when Jose says the same thing, ah, oh, Jose, that's a great idea. And then Maria says, I just said that, but nobody heard me, right? You know, so, and I, and I think that's really important, and I know that the women that are sitting here at this, t at this uh, dais here, uh, women have to learn to speak out, okay? And I think a lot of this, and I say this to the, some of the Latinos in the room, because we have, uh, we're culturized, you know? From the time that we're kids, you know, we are taught in our Latino culture, and hey, don't go unless you're invited, right? No seas entremetida, you know, or entremetido, you know. Don't go where you're not supposed to be, you know. And so we, we're not invited, we don't go. And all these things are happening out there, and we're not there. So we have to say, no, you have to go where you want to be. If you see there's something going on out there and you don't see any people of color there, you got to go there, right? And say, how come I wasn't invited? I'm here. You don't have to be invited. Just go there. And uh, you go look up at the dais, and you don't see any women up there, any people of color. You say, something wrong with that picture. There's no women on the dais. There's no people of color on that dais. Yeah. So, and, and it's kind of for women especially because they say, well, if you're assertive, then they use the old B word, right? You know? What's, what's, uh, what's the B word? I, I think everybody knows. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, if men, if men are assertive, you say, oh, he's strong, you know, he's really a strong leader, you know. But if it's a woman, they, they, oh man, you know, she is, you know, oh man, she's so conceited and this and that. And I always like to tell them, think of Oprah, right? You know, think of Oprah, you know. Like, uh, I, I tell people this a lot, especially to the women. You know, when they talk about the great si se puede, yes we can, uh, thing that Obama used. Well, a lot of people think that Caesar came out with si se puede. It wasn't Caesar, it was Dolores that did that, okay? 
And uh, so we, we shouldn't feel, uh, you know, we shouldn't feel uh, that we shouldn't take credit for our work or if people plagiarize whatever we do. Say, hey, wait a minute, I had one of our, one of our board members once got up and made this great speech taking credit for my work. <laughs> and it was pretty embarrassing for him because I stood up and said, hey, wait a minute, you didn't do that, I did. And he was very embarrassed and he said, afterwards, why did you do that? I said, well, don't ever do that again. Don't get up there and stand up and take credit for my work, you know. And, and it took a little bit of guts for me to do that too because I knew I was going to embarrass him in front of all of these people. But sometimes we have to do that. And you know, Gandhi says that sometimes you have to create conflict, right? And again, as women, we don't want to create conflict. We're raised to be nice little girls, right? Don't get that white dress dirty, you know? Don't climb the tree because you'll fall down and hurt yourself. Don't wrestle with your brother. That's not ladylike. And so we are taught as women uh, to be helpless because we're told somebody's going to support us, somebody's going to take care of us, right? Somebody's going to protect us. And I always like to say, and then while Disney comes along and says, don't worry about a thing because Prince Charming is going to come and give you a big kiss and wake you up and you're going to live happily ever after, right? And sometimes just the opposite comes. A pretender Prince Charming comes, gives you a big kiss, puts you to sleep, there goes your school, there's your career, and then baby's daddy's gone. <laughs> so we have, to, we have to really change the way that we raise our women, right? And the way that we raise our men, too, so that men can be supportive, right? Be supportive and look at every woman as if that woman were his sister or his mother. And uh, our men have to learn to be independent because today's women are not going to be servants anymore, right? So I got a lot of questions about these last comments. <laughs> um, but you know what? Um, I have a lot of questions, but I'm going to give the opportunity to students and let's see which students stand up, which ones believe they have voice, which ones want to express themselves, which ones ha have the, the courage. And if you are of that type, uh, you can come up here and, and line up and we'll let you, uh, allow you, and it'll be a privilege to have you uh, uh, ask questions. Um, so in 19, well, you weren't, so if anybody's got questions, please uh, yeah. come over here. There is no such thing as a bad question, all right? And so uh, just remember that. I don't know. They just took their mitten. <laughs> I don't know about that. Says, Fernando, if I Susan, just may add, please. just really quickly, you know, it just seems for the younger generation, it seems like we're so far removed from what was going on in the you know, 60s and 70s. And, and sometimes, you know, to me, it's so important to pay tribute to those that came before us. Um, when I was in high school, and like I said, it seems like I may be younger, but when I was in high school, I clearly remember going, wanting to go to college and going to my counselor and saying, that's the, the route I want to take, you know, help me get to college. And I remember at the time I was told, honey, that is not for you. you you'll be better off in home economic classes. And so I was put in home economic classes. Needless to say that they, I wasn't helped and I did not go to college until I was 25 until I figured it out on my own. But like I said, it seems like we're so far removed, but it's you know right there. One of my teachers at the time at Belmont High School, incredibly, I was just sharing that with Dolores, was Sal Castro, who actually led the walkouts initially in the 70s because Latinos were treated so unjustly to the point that sometimes they couldn't even use the restroom. They were asked to go outside. They weren't allowed to speak their native language. They were asked you know, to, to change that. And so again, it seems like we're so far removed, but, but we're just a hand away. And I was told I couldn't go to college because that wasn't for me, and they put me in home economic classes. So don't ever let anyone tell you you cannot do it, and that's key. You know your potential. You need to know. You do what you need to do. Yeah. So, you know, Dolores, I mean, you were very successful in organizing farm workers, and, and you had a great membership, but that's been in decline. And we've seen union membership in decline throughout the whole United States. I mean, now I think it hovers around only 11%. Um, and in the public sector, it's much higher, but in the private sector, it's lower. What's going on? And, and yet, we also talk a lot about the great organizing that's going on here in Los Angeles, and it, it's become almost the model of union organizing. But uh, g given the organizing that's going on, why is union membership declining right now instead of go, um, increasing to the degree that it should? Well, it has to do with uh, what the whole topic of this evening is, is about electing people to office, right? <clears throat> I mean, under the Bush administration, <coughs> Bush's administrations, um, we saw that uh, the labor movement, excuse me, <coughs> uh, has had a very hard time. <coughs> it's had a very hard time in organizing uh, because, uh, <coughs> uh, it's had a very hard time in organizing because the laws that protect labor unions to allow them to organize have not been enforced. And in fact, 
labor unions would have an election and then they could never get certified by the National Labor Relations Board. They have to rerun the elections. People were fired. It would take them years to try to get their cases because they were fired for organizing. So all of this strong anti-labor political climate uh, has made it very, very difficult for, labor, for unions to organize. And that goes for all of the national unions. And of course, you know about the, all the jobs that have been sent out of, the, out of the country, right? All the exportation of jobs has also shrunk our manufacturing base. And we have to remember this, that labor unions are the only way in our United States of America that we can redistribute the wealth from the employers to the workers. And without labor unions, we do not have a democracy because labor unions are the ones that create the middle class. So when we see the disappearance of labor unions in our society, it is very, very scary because this is a step to fascism. When you have corporations that control government, I'm gonna repeat that, when you have corporations that control government, it is a very scary situation because corporations are not accountable. When things are privatized, how are you going to make a, cor a corporation accountable to people? They're not. They're private organizations. When you have government, the people that are in government, you can t put them in and you can take them out, right? And so that, that is what the big difference is. And uh, of course, with the farm workers, they've had the same, same problem, is that the political uh, issues under Governor Schwarzenegger, for instance, uh, the Farm Workers Union passed a bill. <coughs> Three times it's passed in the legislature that farm workers can join the union by signing a card. And you can think, if your signature is good enough to buy a car, buy a home, get married, get a divorce, get a passport, you know, open a bank account, it should be good enough to join to represent your union. And uh, Schwarzenegger three times vetoed that law after it passed the legislature. So unions are having a very hard time, and I think you all know what's happening in Wisconsin, where they actually voted to take away collective bargaining rights from public employees, from teachers, you know. And this is a very dangerous thing that's happening in our society, and we have to be aware of this. So it all kind of ties in. We know that in Los Angeles, for instance, a person who really we need to mention, who has done an incredible job in organizing the labor unions here, is Maria Elena Durazo. She is the head of the Central Labor Council. In this last election, and I know many of you have been out there marching with the workers. I want to thank you very much. Thank you very much for helping the workers here uh, at this uh, college organize. It's really important because unions are just an organization of workers so that they can have a voice, so that they can be united, so they can fight for their working conditions, their benefits. But in, and we just saw what happened here historically. We know what happened throughout the whole country where you had like a Republican sweep throughout the country, except where? California, right? And who was out there? People from the Hotel Workers Union, immigrants, people from the uh, uh, service employees, janitors, hotel maids, they were out there knocking on doors, and I'm sure some of you were with them, I was out there with them, knocking on doors, door by door, reminding people that they had to go vote. And I love to say that in this last election in California, we got the most progressive slate ever. Our constitutional officers, from Jerry Brown, from to David Jones, who is now the insurance commissioner, uh, you know, all of them were from Northern California. But guess what? They were elected with the Latino and Latina voters from Los Angeles, okay? Latina and Latino voters from Los Angeles elected the most pro progressive Democratic ticket uh, in, in, in the country, you know? So that, that shows you the power. And this is the way that we, we, we stop that apartheid movement is by organizing, you know, by organizing, organizing, and organizing. Thank you for the question. Uh, Angela Marisol, the second part of the question, and I think um, Dolores kind of touched on it as well, education is the great equalizer, but yet we've elected all these progressive Democrats, and yet we're going to get one of the worst budgets, and it's going to hurt education, budget cuts, we're going to have larger classrooms, the UCs, the CSUs, the community colleges are, are greatly hit. In this era, that education is going to be the great equalizer, how are you as a school board member Angela and Marisol dealing with that and trying to continue to have education as the equalizer? Um, go, ahead. go ahead. Go ahead, Marisol. Um, more than anything, staying away from the classroom, you know, the relationship between student and teacher, um, we start cutting from outside and we really, really try to uh, prevent cuts from occurring within that, that circle. Of but you are going to have to make cuts, right? Yeah, yeah, and, um, and we've been holding on and I'm really proud of our administrators and, and, and 
our board for making, you know, we're a great team, we're a great governance team. Um, and we've been holding on, pero este año, this year, you know, we had to give out some pink slips and next year things might get worse and um, pretty much all the way to 2014. Yeah. Angela? Um, I mean, I think the budget is a huge issue and I think for us at Rio Hondo, we have done everything we can to be fiscally prudent. Um, the state mandates that we have a 3% reserve. We, our policy is to have a 5 and in fact, we've had a larger one. So the last couple years, we've been able to not have to fire anyone. We haven't had any furloughs. We haven't had any um, decreases. So like Marisol said, our first priority is to make sure that we're offering, continue to offer the, the classes to our students. That's our number one priority, keep trying to keep the sections. Two is making sure our faculty, that we don't do furloughs or firing anyone that we can, and same thing with our staff. Um, so I think being fiscally responsible and prudent has been our key um, in the bad years, has, has allowed us to stay afloat these last few years. On the trustee external side, we've been really um, active in advocating to legislatures in terms of making sure that they're trying, you know, that we do um, continue to get what we can from the budget and so that they're not um, cutting us as much as possible as well as, so, so that they're not cutting us and they're not raising fees for our students, which they are, but we're trying to stop the bleeding as much as we possibly can. So um, the LA recommended a, a unit to go from what they were paying $24 to $66. Um, we're trying to stop that right now. It, they'll, they'll charge $36 a unit. Um, but that could change, and so we're trying to be advocates externally to the legislatures to make sure that uh, we let the legislatures know. Uh, I think that we have to, this, this whole education thing, is, it's a crisis, this is a civil rights issue. It is. Because it is. the big push right now is to get rid of public education. Public education is one of the things that labor fought for, you know, along with the eight hour day and safety standards, minimum wage. So we have to understand what's going on in our country right now. Uh, this is really, really scary. They are trying to privatize education. At the end of the day, uh, poor people, like us sitting up here, which were I think, all poor to begin with, would never be able to get a public education. I really recommend that you read The Shock Doctrine by Naomi Klein. It's a thick book. Read that book, and she puts it out chapter and verse how this is happening. And so, you know, we know that there was this war, and still there's this war. We know that there was an economic meltdown. We know that there's 400 millionaires in our United States of America that have more money than 155 million of us. 400 millionaires that have more money than 155 million of us. And you know what? We're gonna use the, the T word, taxes. We're gonna use that word because unless we get more taxes, we're not going to be able to survive this economic meltdown that we had in the war. And you know, um, in Washington state and in Oregon state, they actually passed laws that they tax anybody who makes over $250,000 a year, they have to pay more taxes, okay? And I think that's what we have to do in California, and we've gotta get out there in June to vote. I mean, Governor Brown is trying to extend the taxes that we have now. If they don't extend those taxes, we're gonna have another $12 billion, $12 billion cut in our budget, and the schools are going to suffer. We are fighting for the future of our children in this state. And I believe, and I may be wrong on this, but all of a sudden, where you're gonna have a majority minority population in the state of California, there's no money for education. Yep. That yep. is wrong. And I mean, I sat on the Board of Regents, I was on the Board of Regents of the state of California, and I saw the way some of that money was spent. And, and I know that the students are really suffering right now because of tuition increases and everything, and this is totally wrong. So I, I just wanna say to all the students out there and every, anybody listening on this channel that we've gotta get out there in June, we've gotta get out there and vote. We've gotta to volunteer to go out there into the streets like all of those janitors and, 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 and housemates did to get people to vote to extend those tax extensions uh, on the June ballot. If it gets on the June ballot, they're trying to get it on there. But we are fighting for the life of our education uh, right here in our United States of America and it's starting here in California. Hi, my name's Anna Harris, I'm in Dr. Guerra's class, and um, it looks as though like in a, at the HOPE leadership, as well as uh, grooming Latinas into the halls of power, uh, like political power, but they also do so in the uh, 
arena of, of healthcare. And I was wondering if the panel could expand at all about uh, strides um, for leadership of Latinas in the fields of like uh, public uh, health policy, and uh, especially where it concerns uh, working class Latino women. So, you know, I mean, we talk about political incorporation and we've certainly focused on education, but I think healthcare is one of the major issues. Angela, what? You know, absolutely. I have to say that, um, thank you for that question. That's a great question and bringing us back to um, the Helen's uh, PowerPoint that you mentioned up here. HOPE has been one of the leading organizations in preparing women to take on leadership role no matter what it is. Um, when we were working, I want to introduce Carrie Lopez, who is pivotal in training uh, Latinas in networking, fundraising, campaigning, communicating, understanding the budget, local level issues, whether it be education, healthcare, economic development, um, state. And so the women, the seeds are planted. And I believe at this moment we have a lot of Latina dynamic leaders <coughs> From every political, uh, from every political spectrum, from local, all local areas, and including healthcare. In fact, I have uh, she's my uh, neighbor as well as HLI Comadre, and she works in the healthcare field. And so her ability to be one of the vice presidents, they're looking at implementing the healthcare reform at the moment. And so um, she's able to, at all of our gatherings, a different way, to really ask the question and take it back to her as a vice president of, I know she's a bigwig there, um, but she is using all of those skills to be one of the, um, she realizes a lot of states do not want to implement this healthcare reform, and so she wants to make sure that here in California, because there's even counties in California that do not want to implement that, and so she wants to make sure that she's there in the front lines, making sure the people that need it um, are, they're implementing the reform. Um, and I just want to say some of the things that we have to, as women and as Latinas, be very um, cognizant about is, we, I have three children under the age of three. And one of the things that you know we were talking Wait, about. Let me get this straight. Three children <laughs> under the age of three. Okay, I'm okay. Okay, three and under. I have a three-year-old and twins who are one. Oh, okay. <laughs> but so the idea of moving up your pyramid. Hey, Dolores, three children is that, is that, is that a big deal? Is that a big deal? How many kids do you have? I, uh, I have eleven, and none were twins. <laughs> But, but I think one of the important questions for me and for the pyramid that we saw up there and for a lot of women, including my, my uh, Hope uh, Comadre, is that we have children and families and you have to make decisions about what type of public servant you want to be and how you are able to be that in terms of preparation. You have to be at all the events. You have to be at everything. I have to pick and choose very carefully what I, what I get involved with. Yeah. And so thank you for coming tonight. Yeah, I'm happy to be here. And, you know. I add to that? Uh, Actually, no. Oh, okay. Real quick, real quick. I'm gonna, I, I'm gonna give you the last word, though. No, oh, no. I just want to say about the. He's gonna talk anyway, so go ahead. <laughs> uh, the reason I want to say this is because I think that's another thing we really have to fight for. Because part of the health care bill, uh, Obamacare, that's what they want to call it, is that there's going to be a ton of money uh, for training, training for doctors, training for nurses. Right now, we need 400,000 nurses in California. My oldest son's a doctor. I have a daughter who's a nurse and a granddaughter too. But right now, people can't even become nurses because there's no classes, there's no classrooms, people have to go through a lottery. So think about this, and not only nurses and doctors, uh, lab technicians, I mean, all kinds, you know, they got, they got all this computerized now, equipment and whatever that they use. So be thinking about that. And for not only for yourselves, but for other people in your community, your brothers, your sisters, your cousins, whomever, to try to keep them in school and, and to keep that language, and they need bilingual health practitioners, and of course all of the prevention that we have to do in our communities because of our horrible epidemic that we have with diabetes, hypertension, all of these illnesses that are hitting our community. So think about the, this is a great opportunity for us uh, in the Latino community, so we've got to make sure that that bill stays and it goes through because, and not only for Latinos, for everybody out here, because we do have baby boomers that are coming of age, our, uh, you know, our diets are horrendous as we know. People are getting sick by what they eat, and so we have a lot of work that we have to do. Yeah, I'm glad it was a short comment. <laughs> okay, Marisol, um, you can uh, answer any question about uh, the role of men, uh, get rid of capitalism, which could be the same thing, um, <laughs> and, and, then, and then what advice do you have beyond getting rid of socialism and men? Wow. 
Um, the role of men empowering women is to support them, to support their decisions, um, be there, um, invest in them. Because as a woman and life givers, um, you know, literally, uh, If women don't step up to the plate, especially at this time, the youth, um, and just everyday people, um, men and women alike, and I believe with a feminist uh, idealistic mentality because it is a big future as the world is really becoming smaller, smaller, you know, through the internet, you get all kinds of information, It's it's like, we're a community. Everything affects everything. Um, and women being that female force um, out in the world, um, just we're so capable of so much. And if men stand by our side and really support our decisions and, and that those dreams that we have for our children, for the future of the world as, as we stand, um, the moment as we know it would changed drastically, radically. Um, and I think economics would evolve, uh, you know, from, from those type of leadership roles out in the whole social structure. Um, and the biggest challenges as a woman um, in these positions of leadership is really trying to empower others, others, um, starting with my family, with my children, my community, and extending that, say love, <laughs> to all, you know, through Facebook, through Twitter, through there's so much out there that we have at, at our fingertips. Why not use that technology and, and give those ideas out as they pass through us? Así como me llega, así lo doy. As it comes through me, I just give, because um, that's life. So why not embrace it and really, um, empower everyone around you by beginning with yourself. Susan? Well, first of all, I want to say, um, pretty much I want to echo her sentiments about supporting women. Sometimes I, I see it um, when I used to go to school and as, a, you know, serving, I see that men sometimes expect way too much out of women and they don't realize that, you know, we're trying to balance everything in terms of, you know, educating ourselves, taking care of a home and leading a city. I mean, it's a big challenge and, and the best thing you can do is just, you know, empower them by just allowing them to be them and giving them the freedom to go and pursue whatever dream that they, they do have. Um, I want to talk about some of the challenges that we do see in, um, in politics and just pretty much in every single profession. Um, one of the biggest challenges is that we're not taken seriously at times because we're supposed to fit a certain mold. Specifically, they want us to look like Fernando, I'm sorry, Mr. Guerra. They want us to look like a man. And uh, what I used to do early on, unless you're a man, they don't take you seriously, but what I used to do early on, which, you know, I look back and I wasn't sure why I was doing that, but I remember always trying to look older, dress a certain way because that was going to take me, you know, people are going to take me seriously. And through the years, I learned that I'm me no matter how I dress. And, um, and again, I know this really, really good friend who was very intelligent, smart, such a go-getter. And the difference between her going after what she wanted, you know, if she had a company say, you know, you're too pushy. And if a man came after what he wanted, they would say, wow, what a go-getter, you know, we want him for the job. And, and I think that we have to see that, you know, we don't have to look a certain way and we can be ourselves. And the only advice I can give you is be yourself. Don't let anybody change you. You are who you are and uh, you're smart enough to, to know that and, and take yourself seriously. You don't need anybody else to tell you that. Angela? Um, in terms of elected office, the biggest challenge is there's a difference between campaigning and governing. And you need to know both. So I just want to say that governing is extremely important because of the policy that you're implementing that is directly impacting people's lives. And campaigning is important because if you don't know how to campaign, you may not win. And both are important. Um, I wanted to just advise, be a civic leader. You need to vote. You need to get educated. You need to um, if, take risks and sign up for any leadership uh, type of opportunity you can. If you're Latina, join Hope Leadership Institute, www.latinas.org. 
If you're not, there's Emerge, there's Emily's List, there's other organizations out there that can help you with the preparation so that you could feel fully confident in taking whatever leadership role that you deserve. And so think, lo uh, think globally, act locally, and be the change that you want to see in the world. Dolores. Uh, well, for the guys, um, I think it's important uh, when we think of in terms of uh, a woman uh, being a leader, uh, and women are needed in our civic life, is uh, to be supported. Because remember, when a woman uh, is, uh, has that civic consciousness, and we need women out there, and they can't do it unless they have a support system at home or in the family. But when a woman uh, is a leader, then the whole family are going to be leaders. Her children, everybody else are going to follow that, that mother's footsteps. And, uh, and men can uh, you know, kind of step back sometimes, and maybe uh, we know how to do that, and so we're gonna tell you how to do it, but sometimes women have to learn how to do it by themselves, right, so that they can really learn. And it's really hard to step back sometimes and let somebody else do it. And uh, it's, it's, it's difficult, uh, especially when we have a competition, say, between Latinos and Latinas. Um, I, I would say uh, read Ms. Magazine. Okay, you can get it on, your, on the internet. Uh, it's a very good magazine by the, fe the, the feminist majority has, and that there you'll be able to learn about, about feminism and learn about the women's history, and what women had to go through to get the right to vote, uh, the kind of discrimination that women suffer. And we know, as we sit here right now, that a woman somewhere is getting raped, a woman's getting beaten, a woman's getting murdered because some man thought they owned that woman's body. And you know, have to know that a woman's body, nobody owns it but herself and only a woman can control her reproductive rights. This is a woman's you know, uh, right. Uh, in terms of um, capitalism versus socialism, all right? Well, if we look to the Scandinavian countries uh, like Denmark you know, uh, and Sweden, what do they have that we don't have? National health care from the crib to the grave, national health care. And people, sure, they pay higher taxes, but they're very, very protected. In those countries, you never see them going to war. It's kind of interesting. Norway which is a very small country. You know, it's one of those socialist countries. They have uh, actually $400 billion surplus in their budget. You know, we're struggling, right? We have all these so-called deficits. $400 billion surplus. Where do they get all that money? From their oil. They own their oil. We in the United States of America, we do not own our natural resources. Corporations own our natural resources. We are the only country in the world that does not own their natural resources, okay? And another little country that is a socialist country where people have free education, free medical care is Cuba. By the way, I just saw this movie called Collapse. If you ever see, it's a documentary called Collapse. And it's an interesting movie to talk about what our future is gonna look like. And the only country that they say might escape this terrible future, what happens if we have no more oil, is Cuba. Okay, uh, and uh, let's see, I, I just also, well, I did mention this magazine, and I can't remember what the third question was. It was about advice to Latinas who wanna follow in your footsteps. Besides having 11 children, what else should they do? <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, like the challenges, and it's really hurtful, I wanna say, you know, all of us, you know, when we suffer from racism, which a lot of us people of color do, we know how hurtful that is, you know? And those, those pains of racism, you know, they, they stay with you forever. You know, it's such a, it's such a, it, it's a damages one's psyche. It's very hard to get over when you, uh, you know, been, um, you know, you've, you've been discriminated because you're, because you happen to be black or brown, <clears throat> and uh, or Asian, and uh, when sexism, you're discriminated because you're a woman. It's even more hurtful because it's usually by the people that you know, and the people that you're working with, and people that shouldn't be going against you. And I think that is one of the hardest things uh, for women to overcome. And uh, it, the thing I wanted to say to women, as we face these discriminations as you go through life and you're gonna get it from your partners and, and, and other people, uh, just uh, kind of keep on going and don't let it get you down. Because if we let it, it'll destroy your self-esteem and your confidence. And, and it's very, very hard to overcome. Very hard to overcome. And I think that is one of the most difficult, difficult things when you see slides and you see people organizing around you and conspiring against you. Uh, and it happens. And sometimes guys do it kind of naturally, right? They can't help it. That's the way they were raised. <laughs> so, so we have to just be, and women have to know what the power plays are. You know, we're kind of innocent, 
uh, guys, they know from the time that they're playing marbles out there. They can walk into a room and they can check out all the PowerPoints immediately. And we women, we just walk in, we don't even know what's going on, you know? <laughs> and so I think we have to learn those things. Uh, there's a great book uh, that I read when called, when a great book called uh, Games Mother Never Taught You. And it's about the power games. And there's another book called, called Power by Michael Corda. The Games Mother Never Taught You was by a woman named Betty Jane Harrigan. I don't even know if it's in print anymore, but it's such a great, because it explains this power stuff to us. And I want to say, women, we're afraid to take power. We think there's something wrong with power. Yeah, men, I'm afraid to interrupt her. But men, but, take, but. men take it naturally. But I just want to say this to everybody. Power, <laughs> power is like love, okay? Don't be afraid to take it. Don't be afraid to use it and share it. Because the more you share it, the more it grows, like love. Yes. I, want to, I want to thank you guys for saying as late as you did. Thank you very much, and thank them.